My name is Umaru Sandamadu. My guest is a minister for Zongo Development, Inner Cities and Zongo Development. Before then, he was aide to Nanado Dankwakufado, the president now of the Republic. He's also the deputy campaign manager of the New Patriotic Party into election 2020. Sheikh Dr. Mustafa Abduhamid. Is there a Laji in there somewhere? No. Uh, so I haven't done the Hajj. I haven't had, gone to Hajj. Why? Um, Sheikh Isikwe would give you free tickets. Uh, yeah. Mm. You know, everybody has their um, targets in life for doing the things that they want to do. Quite frankly, I had told myself ever since I was a young man that I'll do the Hajj when I'm 50 years. Oh, okay. That's if I have life. If I don't have life, it's not a compulsory pillar of Islam. But if I have life, I'll do it at 50. Why? It's just me. Because the Prophet Muhammad says that at 50, it's when a human being has gained absolute maturity. And that at the age of 50, any person who is found doing, if you want, all of the vices, basically, mm -hmm. in... in is, is basically married to Satan at that age. So in other words, 50 is an age of cleansing. And the Hajj is a cleansing ritual. So I want to tie that age to the ritual of cleansing. Wow. So that when I go and I come at, after the age of 50, I become ritually clean, spiritually clean. And preparing and then, for your grief. And preparing for my grief, basically. Wow. I, I, may, I may consider that. that <laughs> but, but then, and forgive me, this is not a conversation, but yeah. since you are a lecturer, it's good to learn these things from you. Our con constitution says before you become president, you should be 40 plus. Yes. Um, maybe we should be pushing it to 50 if you're looking at the Islamic No, no, no. Culture. I said that's why I, I use the word cleansing, the mm -hmm. age of cleansing. There's the age of maturity and then there's the age of cleansing. Okay. At 40, you have gained maturity. Okay. Okay. But you still have um, some tendencies mm -hmm. for sliding and okay. falling okay. And, and so on. But okay. at the age of 50, you are supposed to have been absolutely well-rounded mm -hmm. and properly matured to be able to say, now I am on the journey towards my maker. I see. Yeah. Tell me why muslims or zongo people need a special dedicated ministry there are people who think that there are so many people who are struggling why should we specialize the zongo people and give them a special ministry and even give them a fund what is so special about zongo people why this ministry well the reason is because first of all it's important to correct the point that this is a ministry of inner city and zongo development Okay, um, inner city being the urban poor communities. And then also the Zongo communities. I always tell people that all Zongo communities are inner cities, but not inner cities are Zongo communities. Now though, there is, there is also a rural Zongo phenomenon. But hitherto, the Zongo phenomenon was exclusively urban. You know, the, the Zongo uh, phenomenon started as an urban phenomenon. Now we also have Zongo communities in rural areas. So um, it is important to target this group of people because, I mean, everybody knows the effects of poverty, um, a lack of education, illiteracy, then makes people vulnerable. And those vulnerabilities, as we have seen all across the world, can lead young people into all manner of vices, you know, even it is these um, urban deprived young people that are used to foment trouble across various countries or even the Boko Haram phenomenon mm -hmm. in Nigeria. The, the, the most um, people who serve as soldiers for that phenomenon are the urban deprived people who are easily fed with messianic concepts, concepts of a better day to come than the the earthly political authority that has made your condition like this and so on so as the akan people say if your your neighbor's beard is on fire you try to fetch water Put by, your side. by your own mm. side mm. you know so this the president thought that after over 60 years of independence it is important that we tackle the phenomenon of urban uh, poor uh, head on and the bulk of that phenomenon is what we call Zongo communities in Ghana. So I have had conversations with people and someone says to me, okay, so there is an ever boy living in East Legon. 
the mother sells umbilical cloth. I don't know what the English word for that is. And that's how she survives and sends him to the public school there. That child is vulnerable. That child is a product of poverty. Why don't we have a special ministry for that child, yet we have one for a similar circumstance in Nima? Because there are other programs that seek to level the platform for every Ghanaian, irrespective of where they are. Including Zongo children and Zongo people. Of course, mm -hmm. of course. So the point I'm making to you is that the young boy in um, the Legon. uncompleted building mm -hmm. in East Legon, mm -hmm. whose mother is struggling, has an opportunity in our educational programs uh, to be able to go to school now, um, whether or not the mother is poor. Um, now, poor people, people in, from deprived schools are able to go to Mfansepem, Achimota, and etc., etc. Hitherto, those schools were reserved only for the elite, and so on. So that leveling is taken care of by the other social protection programs that President Akufuado has, mm -hmm. you know, such as free SHS and, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, but you see, if you have a large concentration of the, you are talking about isolated cases, East Legon, um, Ebia, Jowulu, yeah. Jowulu, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But when you have all of that Jowulu and East Legon put together in one sprawling community, then it means that the problem is even more accentuated. So you need and a special more level of leveling than what you already have. Ex exactly. But in other words, you need some intensity. So deliberateness. Absolutely. But the leveling, because if a child is in Nima, they can still go to Wege or any school. Yeah, but you to. see, the ones that are living in East Legon and Jowulu that you are talking about, um, don't, they have amenities. They have proper clinics. They have social services they Lombard have, has they, have they have um i'm coming mm. they have street lights their alleyways are well paved they have very good schools inside jowulu etc you know the, the society there is more laid out it's better planned than the urban poor settlements which so part of the thing is not just the human development but even in terms of restructuring the habitat in which the people live okay Let's talk about schools. So there are schools everywhere, government schools. And from what I'm picking up, just by virtue of the fact that this school is located in a zango, it, it produces students with less quality. Is it a case that there's less supervision in the zangos, even though they are the same public schools? Is that something you would first of all agree with, that there's less education in Zangos, even though they have the same facilities and same teachers passed by the same GES? Yes, some of it is, is historical, some of it is systemic. So I'll tackle the historical first. You know, education generally was brought into this country by Christian missionaries. Okay, um, Zion Mission, Presby, Wesley. So Wesley, all of those. Mm -hmm. So for a very long time, there was huge reluctance on the part of Muslims and Zango people mm -hmm. to take their children to school because there was the fear. And to, to confess, as a scholar, I have uh, researched and published on that phenomenon. That it, it, it wasn't just fear. It was fear that was founded, that many of them were compelled to com convert to Christianity, even names. At that time, when you took your child to school, they were compelled to take on Christian names in addition to their Muslim names. Is the reason my father didn't let any of his children go to school except me? Ah, absolutely. So, so it means that what I'm saying is borne out even by yes. your family history. Yes. Exactly. So for a very long time, we weren't taking our children to school for that fear. So it took us over 80 years until about 19, early 70s when a deliberate policy by the Champon government sought to establish an Islamic education unit, you see, with the sole purpose of giving Muslims some comfort okay. and Zumbo people some comfort. That, okay, now we have our own Islamic unit. Mm -hmm. We have our own Muslims heading it. We have our own Muslim people attending those schools. Mm -hmm. Arabic is being taught in those schools. Then it gives them comfort to be able to take their children. Mm -hmm. to. But by then, we're already 18 years behind time. So that's number one. That's the historic. The systemic is that 
after the creation of the Islamic Education Unit, the other religious education units are more endowed. Presby, Catholic, you know, the Catholic Church mm -hmm. is, 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 is quite rich mm -hmm. all across the world. Yeah. Uh -huh. So they are able to endow their schools with better facilities, pay their teachers better, and so on. So you have various schools within Catholic education, Presby, Anglican, etc., which churn out excellent material, which are called excellent schools. Are, are you following me? And that's what even all the way even to SS, you have yeah. St. Rose's, yeah. Archbishop Porter, yeah. this, that, that, that. But right now, on top of your head, you cannot mention one school within the Islamic Education Unit that you can equate to a Matthias of Uganda, for example. That's true. You, you cannot. I mean, the, the, the Ahmadis will be struggling, even though they have the best of amongst them. Exactly. Even they will be struggling. They, even they will be struggling. So mm -hmm. that's the systemic, mm -hmm. systemic aspect. Mm -hmm. So this Zongo Development Ministry is part of the effort to intervene to correct the systemic imbalance okay. within fantastic the, uh, so education. in this correction you're going to do it both physically and maybe through other means yes please on the specific issue of physical the minister for works and housing your colleague yes i don't know whether you're in cabinet are you in cabinet yes please good your colleague in cabinet atachi has said he's going to turn nima into villaggio I mean, mm. he didn't use Villaggio, but he essentially said... Well, he yes, it gives a mental picture. It still hasn't happened three years on since your ministry was created, since he became minister, since Akufado became president. Well, I'm not ex ex his spokesperson. Yes. Um, but I can see his, his concept that um, you need not just Nima, but most of these urban poor settlements... To, to be better structured, especially um, alleyways, this, that, that, all of those things. That is his, his concept. Um, he started, I guess that he, he did what they call, he, he flew a kite, you know, basically to throw the idea to see a crystallization of minds, you know, people, because it is not a matter that has come before the cabinet table for discussion yet. It is his idea. And I guess he's still in the consultations. He spoke to me and I said, go and consult the chiefs and consult the people in, in the Nima he area. He spoke matter-of-factly when he yeah. granted me an interview. Yes, because, because, years ago. because it is very firm in his mind that this is what, what he wants to do. That's what he means by the, that's what you mean by the matter-of-factly. That as Minister for Works and Housing, this is what I want to do. That's the matter-of-fact. But that there are actually... There's actually a cabinet decision to do that. Happened. No, it hasn't. But you don't think that that still saddles the government in some sort of trouble, that people will start quoting the minister for us and housing, whether or not it's going before cabinet. They'll say, oh, Zongo minister, you are supposed to turn Nima into Villagio. It's having happened. It's going to be an indictment on your administration as a minister and your government. Well, I'm not so sure about indictment because the Ghanaian people know, at least the many Ghanaian people know, mm -hmm. the processes that decisions go through in order to become reality. Mm -hmm. um, and in this country, um, you, are, you are free to, 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 to yeah. if you want, propose. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's a proposal. So, so let's talk sure. about since your ministry came now, um, so that no one accuses you of collecting salary and doing nothing. Yes, please. Tell us some of the things you've done in Zangos. Okay. You, because that seems to be the more popular one. Of course, you also have inner cities. But in Zangos specifically, yes, what has your ministry and your Zango Development Fund done? that we should be applauding you for? Well, first of all, it's, it's not about an applause. We, we just do our work. As for applause, I'm not sure that, um, you know, there's a Dagomba saying that uh, humans will never be called good until they are in their graves. That's true. So my, my principle of life is that just do what you have to do. Reward, applause. It's a bonus. Okay. So I'll go straight to what we have done. I'm, I, don't, I don't really care about the applause. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the president has given us, um, if you want, I think four uh, mandate areas. So thematic areas. Yes. Okay. Um, per, the, per his program of economic and social development. You know, every president, when you come to power, you are supposed to go to uh, parliament mm -hmm. and present a program for your social and economic development policy for a four-year period. Mm -hmm. So the one that President Akufuado has presented to this right. parliament, actually it's an eight-year program because it's 2017 to 2024. Um, 
program mm -hmm. um, of development in page 116 that's where the mandate of the ministry of inner city and zongo development and the zongo development fund is captured okay and it says one your duty shall be one to improve on educational and health infrastructure okay so that's in, one in zongo. yes that's one so, so let, let's when you list the theme tell yes. me one or two things you've done so that we can because of time so oh, okay. improving education and health infrastructure yes. what have you done where yes we we've we've built um school blocks i mean um, classroom blocks in many zongo communities if you go to konongo zongo for example beautiful six classroom block okay. is uh is is there okay um you go to tolong the zongo community there's another beautiful um six classroom block that is there um one in kj um in the volta region um, okay. so that's education how about health yes that's education in, in terms of the health infrastructure, this um, chip compound um, that is being redone, actually it was already existing, very run down, dilapidated, and the community people said, this is what we want. This is so you are redeveloping it. Yes, redeveloping it. I saw it pictures of you commissioning a, a, a once-room toilet. <laughs> what was that about? That after four years you built only one KVIP and you are happily cutting something? Yeah, in, in, in politics, mischief is allowed. Mischief is allowed. Um, first of all, Ghana, um, I don't know what the current statistics are, but until we came to power in 2017, Ghana together with Sudan were rated as the two countries with the most abysmal record in the production of toilet facilities. In other words, that these two countries were the one with the highest rates of open defecation in the world, mm -hmm. Ghana and Sudan. A lot of that happened along our beaches mm -hmm. because the inner city communities along the coast don't have these facilities, so they go to the beaches to defecate. Mm -hmm. Now, the effect of that also is that it drives away tourists, you know, because tourists to most of these countries by the coast, they, they like to come because of the beautiful mm -hmm. beaches mm -hmm. and so on. We don't have beautiful beaches because of all this phenomenon. So we, as part of our mandate, in this ministry in intervening in the health sector because mind you sanitation facilities are health matters okay so we decided that we should intervene to provide toilets for the people in this inner city community okay. so that's the mind one we you, saw you opening yes okay so mind you there's also a bigger program mm -hmm. called the gamma project mm -hmm. where the world bank itself is supporting the communities in these areas to acquire toilets yeah. it's four thousand cities per per toilet per, per per facility okay the world bank was paying two thousand nine hundred and then every household is supposed to contribute the inhabitants of the household you contribute one thousand one hundred mm -hmm. to make it four thousand and the world bank would come and intervene but because of the urban the phenomenon of urban poverty we realized that many hundreds of households there not could not even raise the thousand one hundred cities so this ministry in decided that we will pay the counterpart of the 1,100 cities to the World Bank project so that they build these toilets. Okay. And we intervened in, so far, 252 houses, okay. households, Household. inside Adabraka, Osu, Jamestown, Kolegono, Kolewokon, all of those areas. Okay. Okay. And that is, those are the ones that we went okay. around to go and inspect. Other things, so after education and health, which other yeah, things? Yes, so education, health, recreation. Recreation. Recreation is the ones that we are doing with the AstroTurf and Green Park Are those priorities, projects. AstroTurf in Zangos, is that a priority? Yes, it, it's, it's a huge priority. Who told you that? Um, the people themselves. Okay. The people themselves. Um, the people say that they don't have recreational spaces. That's number one. And in, in Zango communities, you know, as a Zango boy, that we have a lot of social activities because mm. of the religion. Yeah, the you communal know. nature. Of Aha, mm. Aure, mm. Suna, mm. Idi, mm. Maulidi, mm. all of those things. Mm. So even grounds for these celebrations and so are non-existent. Are non-existent. Okay. Just give me the last two themes, and yes. then we have to take a quick break. So, <laughs> health, so, mm. so I've talked about health and sanitation. I've talked Recreation. about education and education and then we talked about development of businesses okay. is one of 
one of our mandates. And the last one would be what? And then uh, development of businesses and then promotion of culture. Okay. I'll come back so that we'll talk more on your ministry plus politics. This okay. is face to face on City TV. My guest is Dr. The Sheikh in the Dr. Sheikh Abdul Hamid uh, Mustafa. He's Minister for Zango Development and Inner Cities as well. Uh, we'll come back and also speak generally about the Akufado administration. How has it fared thus far and why they should be voted for? He is a deputy campaign manager. Don't worry. On the 7th of December, you will be going to the polls to elect a member of parliament. How well do you know your constituency? We take a visit to the Awutu Senya East constituency of the central region. We are coming to you from the Ishaya Soul constituency in the Ashanti region. I'm still in the Aswase constituency. Political parties will be campaigning for your vote. We have almost about 80 to 90 different projects across the country. There is no single school under any electoral area. That has not seen the development of Honorable Muntaka. But as a constituent, what will inform your choice of a candidate to represent you in Parliament? My party is my community. What program are you bringing in to solve the problem of my community? <laughs> Be involved in what concerns you. My name is Premier Dunyame. Join me on the constituency for all you need to know concerning your social economic development. The constituency airs on City TV Mondays to Thursdays at 5 30 p.m. You're welcome back to Face to Face on City TV. I am Omar Sandamad. My guest is the Minister for Zongo Development. He's also Deputy Campaign Manager of the NPP. John Dramani Muhammad and the NDC have promised mugs to benefit Muslim communities. You talked about mischief. It seems the NPP has deliberately twisted that and you are saying something else. No, I'm not sure that the NPP has said anything. I'm sure you've also heard um, imams and other Muslim clerics and Zango people talk about the fact that um, they don't need mortuaries. Umaru, I mean, for, for objectivity sake, I'll tell you what the need is. Clearly, there's a need um, for, um, if you want, um, death ceremonies. Rituals. Yes. Okay. Um, but the answer is not mortuaries. Muslims, because... Um, per the tradition of our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we are not supposed to keep dead bodies for long. Okay, so clearly, we, we don't even need mortuaries. If you go to Tamale, which is perhaps uh, one of the most populated towns in Tamale with the highest number of um, Muslims, mm -hmm. you would hardly find a Muslim dead body in Tamale's mortuary. We, we, don't, we don't use the mortuary services in Tamale. So clearly, there's no need for mortuaries in Zambia. What is needed is that Muslims are always complaining. And as minister, I sit here every, almost every week. I have to intervene two or three times with some um, hospital authorities for the release of our bodies. You know, there's a, a law, a coroner's law. I don't know how the law is called. Mm -hmm. Law governing when somebody goes to hospital mm -hmm. and dies. You know, when you are sent to a hospital... And within, in less than 24 hours, you die. The law mandates the hospital to conduct an autopsy to determine the cause of your death. Normally, if you are already admitted in the hospital for about a week or two, the doctors know what they've been treating mm -hmm. you for. Mm -hmm. And so when you die, it's easier for your body to be released to your family. But normally, the problem is with those who come in and then they die. 
But the NDC and says... And so, I'm coming. Mm -hmm. So, the people are always clamoring, give us our body, give us our body to go and, and bury. So now, what is the answer? The answer is, how do we ensure that even in keeping with the law, we still allow Muslims um, the, the day or 12 hour period or less to be able to take their, their bodies to go and bury. So the NDC should have been saying, when we come into power, we will establish a regime within the hospitals that allow Muslim bodies to be released early for them to do their burial. It's a very simple statement that you need to put. But, but you're not going to go and build mortuaries that they are not going to use. But you see, you can't control what the hospital system will say. If the hospital say we need to do a corona inquest, yes. or we have to do an autopsy or whatever, yes. you cannot control and force the hospital to release the body. So what the NDC have said, and I have, I've read their manifesto and I've yes. listened to John Hammer speak, yes. is that they're going to produce or provide a support system to the existing mortuaries of the hospital. So even though your side is saying it's going to be one zongo, one mortuary, they have mm -hmm. said that they did not say, and indeed the document doesn't say that they're going to build mortuaries in zongos. Instead, every hospital will have an attaching morgue. And they said they, we have such things in Kumasi, for instance. They said that there's a, an attached morgue for Muslims, where Muslims are kept dressed and all of that before they are taken out to be buried. Surely that should not be a problem. I think I've seen something like that in the Kufredo Government Hospital. Under President Kufu in Kumasi at the Konfanochi, uh, at the Konfanochi Hospital, there was this prominent Muslim Zango man called Alaji Shekai, who, per the arrangements of the Kufu administration, was the point man between the hospital and the Muslim communities of Kumasi, mm -hmm. whereby if somebody died, Alaji Shekai shows up. He was that was basically his work. So he was always around the hospital. You go and see Shekai, Mutumimu, Yarasu, Haka Haka. And then he would go to the administration, talk with them, go through the process as quickly as possible. They were not subverting the law, mm. but just that they would make sure that a doctor is called on hand quickly mm. if an autopsy has to be done. Mm. And so on. Because you see, we are not necessarily advocating as Muslims that we should skip uh autopsy completely okay. because otherwise many people would murder people mm -hmm. you just ingest poison into somebody and then once they take the person you rush them to hospital mm -hmm. and then they die and because we are not supposed to do you autopsy test. it will be a recipe for murder mm -hmm. and, and i don't think that okay. we want to be accessories to that kind of thing but what we are saying is that quickly there was that system in place with alaji shekai where they would then quickly do the autopsy, get the, the body to the family. And they, that system was there throughout the Kufu era. Mm -hmm. It is NDC came to power in 2019 and threw Alaji Shekai out in 2009 and said that he was an MPP person, so Bamu Son Kananga, and then the system collapsed. Yeah, but, so you but, are the same people yeah, who collapsed the yeah, system. But you, you, can't, you can't use someone who is not a part of the hospital to be doing such administrative stuff for people they don't even know. That may not, you, have, you have essentially planted a guru boy at the hospital. That's what you have done. No, because it was, it was official in the it, sense it that... It have been official. This, I don't this, have an appointment this, later. What, what, what are the NDC people saying? They, 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 are, they are basically saying the same thing that Muslims need a system. Yeah, they put a system. Yeah, but you didn't put a system. You just but took one man. I like the Sheikh, may yes. be collecting money, and I'm not saying he has, but I'm yes. saying he may be collecting money from people. How do you account for that? Let's move on. One yes. of the mandates of your ministry yes. is to ensure education in the Zangos. Yes. Early child marriage is a problem in the Zangos. What have you done about that? Well, first of all, I mean, there are two ways of resolving the matter. One, it is important also to realize that per, per research, published research, part of the reason people give their way, away their daughters early for marriage is because they don't have the facility for educating them to highest level, higher levels. You know, so there's a lot of research at the Department of Education at UCC that have seen, that has said that people are always weighing between educating boys and girls. And then they always come to the conclusion that, look, let's forget the girls. Let's invest our mm -hmm. monies in the boys because they are not going to get pregnant and et cetera, et cetera. And so these girls are left out. And once they are left out, they are forced to go into early marriage. So I am saying to you that this decision to introduce free senior high school is a huge leap mm -hmm. in the effort towards preventing early marriages in our Zango communities because now all the girls are able to go to school without an excuse that they were not well educated. But sometimes it's and culture so and religion. That's number one. Number, no, I'm coming. Mm -hmm. Number two, 
as for the religious, the um ulama, I mean, are already educating our population to the effect that um, it is not <laughs> a pillar of Islam that your daughter that is 50 years or 60 years ought to get married. In any event, the conditions that existed in Arabia in the 7th century are not the same conditions that exist today in the 21st century in Ghana. The ulama are already having that education. Now, what is left is for a government to provide them the wherewithal to be able to accelerate or, if you want, push these children beyond junior high school. And Akufuado has provided the facility for doing so. Should people not be arrested? Because this happens all the time. Every now and then we hear stories of these people being married off at these very young ages. If we have a ministry, at least we should have said that by 2018, this has stopped. It hasn't stopped. Well, the minister for ministry, actually, not minister, the ministry of gender and social protection, I know, has been actively engaged in this phenomenon, not only within Zango communities, but all across the country, mm -hmm. in the north, etc., etc. I mean, uh, in the efforts, one, I have read a few cases where they have even gone and rescued children who were forcefully married before the poverty. And let me come back to the point that if you interview the parents who give their young girls out for marriage, they always make the point that they are doing so because of poverty and etc. Sometimes because a richer man would be able to then take care of their families and so on. So one of the fundamental ways of taking this phenomenon out within our society is also to address the phenomenon of access to education. Okay. In 2016, you were aide to Nana Adodan Kwakufado. Yes, please. You called a press conference at your party's office at Asylum Down. Yes, please. You cried and said that John Muhammad, the president at the time, had given a vehicle, Mitsubishi Pajero, to Bugri Nabu, Daniel Bugri Nabu, one of your chairmen at the time. Yes, please. Where is that car? <laughs> it was packed in the uh, MPP headquarters um, in 2016. Quite frankly, I, I don't know where it's, it's gone. But you've been in office for four years. If yes. you accuse the sitting president of corruption, yes. you should have seen some processes four years on that at least you have written to him to explain or you are possibly planning some action in court. Nothing like that has happened. What would you say to any critic who say what you did that day, where you shed tears, was a fraudulent act? Oh, no, it cannot be. I mean, it was a press conference that showed the evidence, that showed the bank account number, the amount that was given him, the deposit receipt, how much he had already withdrawn, uh, the car, the papers were all shown to the journalists as the evidence. I mean, the company that imported the car, who were the owners of that company, the owners of that car, all of that linked to um, um, President Mahama's um, office. So you have so all the evidence? If, yes, of course. So mm -hmm. we, we, we showed the evidence. But, I mean, that's a case of um, bribery of a party chairman. You know, it's, it's not, it doesn't have anything to do with us in taking government money and giving. So I'm not but sure bribery that. Is bribery. That was more, yeah. So it was moral, moral corruption. And, and morality and ethics is an integral part of leadership. And, but if somebody falls short in the area of morality and ethics, it is for, for public um, judgment. I'm not sure morality um, is, is, is a prosecutable or so justice. So we shouldn't legalize morality, you think? Mat oh, yeah. That's what um, some countries do but, when they but, say... But what happens when you're defaming people in the in the way you did it if you wanted to prove that it is true what you said you'd go to court but you no, call a press no, conference no, no, and tarnish the image of a president no no and four years Umaru, you haven't done anything Umaru, Umaru. right now this interview we are having mm -hmm. if we finish the interview and you go and sit on your station in ctfm and brandish um hundred cd notes and say see mustafa hamid he he bribed me mm -hmm in my office but mm. to to get the evidence i took the money and this is the money and and so on you have shown what you believe is mm -hmm. the evidence for mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. if i refute that matter i should go to, i would go to court and challenge you to prove that those notes are attributable to me or are traceable to, to me that that's what so you should everyone do. So can... we, we provided the evidence and everything so if they believe strongly that they didn't have any such contact with Bugri Nabu and everything. They should have gone to court to sue Bugri Nabu and their party 
for doing that press conference. So, and then we would go so when people, th th when people throw corruption mad at Nana Akufuado now, yes. they shouldn't be blamed for doing that, should they? When they say that Mahama is, I mean, Nana Akufuado is corrupt, in fact, John Mahama said, well, he re echoed Sakawa boys. Yes. They shouldn't be blamed for saying those things and that you are selling the destiny of the country through oh, corrupt people, means in people, the Japan royalties. People should expect you rather to go to court and clean yourself, not the NDC justifying. <laughs> people, there's no such evidence. Okay, there's no such evidence of anything that, that they are talking about. If they are saying that President Kufuado, okay, took a Ford ex exhibition from a contractor in Burkina Faso. Kanazwe. I don't know what, what it is. I'm just giving you an That's example. That's his name, Kanazwe. Oh, there was such an incident. Okay. <laughs> so I'm just giving an example. That if President Kufuado <laughs> took a Ford expedition from a contractor from Burkina Faso, and there's evidence that that contractor has been given a contract to do some roads in the OT region, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Yes, then we would then challenge that matter either before Shraj or so. And you've seen evidence of government appointees who have gone to Shraj, uh, like the former appointee under President Kufu, mm -hmm. um, former roads minister Richard Anani, mm -hmm. when President Kufu himself, when they alleged that his house, he had gold water closets and this and that, he went to Shraj. In the end, the people couldn't substantiate the thing. And he was, so if there is such evidence, we will go to court to vindicate our name. But if it's just people throwing things up in the air, in the public, we trust the mind of the Ghanaian people that they know what is propaganda from what is substance. If people have substance, they will go to the appropriate forum. We have performed better is one of the slogans of your government. How better have you performed in fighting corruption? Because we have reiterated several times that the kinds of money budgetary allocations that our government has made to these anti-corruption institutions has been three fourfold over what other governments have done first of all most of these corruption anti-corruption institutions had complained over the years of a lack of resources that they don't have the resources to prosecute their cases. Their offices in the various districts are closed. If somebody has a case in Hamili, he doesn't. All of those things. In increasing budgetary allocation and in supplying them with the tools to be able to do their work, it's a huge, um, if you want, fight uh, in, in empowering them to be able to do their work. And, 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 and we have done that. But you have done that. The Office of Special Prosecutor is still bleeding. Um, we have been told he has chosen the huge building near Parliament House, the Get Fund building. As we speak, he hasn't moved in. The budget that he's given, 180 million, we are told it's only 3 million or so that is disbursed to his office because he doesn't have the staff to even uh, consume that money that is given to him. So it's almost like showmanship what you are doing, window dressing of corruption. You have sent your Auditor General home a few months to elections and uh, strange circumstances even though you said he was going to go on leave that would not be a party where government is serious in fighting corruption i'm, I'm not sure um that if people um, are due for their leave period and then the appointing authority says take it take your leave it is uh if you want a dent on the fight against corruption that president has existed um, before. A bad president. Um, I'm not sure if it is a bad president. It's just that if, if, if it is time for you to take your leave, you ought to take your leave. That has nothing to do with um, pushing back on corruption. Now, secondly, the, the point that you made about the office of the special prosecutor, I'm sure that what you are parroting or saying now is a phenomenon that I heard in the early part of the establishment of that office in 2017. It hasn't We've changed. since gone past that. Well, I haven't heard him complain. I, I, I have heard him been reading public, his epistles. Pu public space. Um, the recent epistles he's been writing is about working with Rawlings. Mm. So, um, the, the, the public prosecutor, the office of the special prosecutor, now is talking about things that he's doing uh, in, and, and, and so on. And he's doing them. I, I haven't heard him complain lately. Let's talk about health. Yes. The NDC would point to hospitals and say this is what they have left behind in four years what are you leaving behind well you see healthcare is not the establishment or the building of empty shelves 
okay shells in themselves don't kill people it is what you put in there the where without the capacity for hospitals for health institutions and so on to be able to administer healthcare to people that's what is important otherwise why we would just go around the country and put up empty shells and then people don't have access to healthcare. When we came, the National Health Insurance Scheme, which has proven to be the biggest intervention in our health sector in, in many decades, was on the brink of collapse. It owed the, the, the service provided 1.2 billion CDs. People, by, the, by December 2016, hospitals were no longer taking national health insurance cards. We, we've, we've, we've been able to reverse The University that, of Ghana that, Medical that Center was not an empty shell. The Ridge Hospital was not an empty shell. The Bank of Ghana Hospital was not an empty one. The Shai Osudoku you know, District Hospital was not an empty one. The Ga East Hospital, which you used to treat COVID, was not an empty shell. University of Ghana Medical Center, when we come, it wasn't operational. It was an empty shell. You you build the. You had everything you in put, there. What, it, it even, the, there. even the air conditioners were running when we went to check. It was simply listen, an issue listen. of administrative fight over edu health ministry versus Kolibu Teaching Hospital. Clearly, that was that was a struggle. Well, but even even so, if, so, so fast forward. Which yes. empty shells are you leaving behind? Which which empty shells are we? Are we yeah, because if that's if it's going to be a comparative analysis, yes. and if you are doing the comparative record mm -hmm. of NDC's eight years. In government versus our three years in government then I'm telling you that in three years the systems that we have put in place that allows people to access health care in terms of a resuscitation of the national health insurance scheme they provide the provision of one ambulance for every district and extra mm -hmm. that allows people to get to health facilities in time the provision of medical equipment medical supplies to hospitals to be able to allow people to access health care in my view in three years is preferable to an eight-year tenure that only um, gets you to show three or four health facilities okay. what is what is the use of Accra Medical Center to my mother in Widana because she wants to go to the Widana health facility there Jamal and be Jamal able to find a nurse there who, who will attend to her. That's what is important Jamal to her. Jamal made his ministers commit a percentage of their salary to building cheap compounds. Your mother in Widana would, would benefit from the cheap compound in that community. Did, you, did, you, did they come to account to you for that money? Did they show you how many cheap compounds? They said they built 15 or, or so. Prop, and, and where are they? I'm sure we can trace them if we say. Absolutely. So that's for, for them to, to show us. This is face-to-face -face on CCTV. When we come back, it's a corona election. How easy or difficult is it to campaign? His deputy campaign manager will talk to him about that. Plus, it's a year of roads. Um, it's still on the government's head. We'll talk about that too. Don't worry. Election 2020, Ghana makes a choice. Tracking and bringing you reports of the presidential and parliamentary campaigns across the length and breadth of this nation. Analyzing campaign activities and election data with our panelists on the Voters' Diary. The Voters' Diary is the most factual, instructive, and balanced election 2020 analysis program on television. The Voters' Diary, every weekday on City TV from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. Stay informed on all the relevant issues on election 2020. Tune into the Voters' Diary, it's Ghana's choice. City TV is live on DSTV. Go to channel 363. On Go TV, access City TV on channel 182. On a digital TV, please press the menu button on the remote control and run a new search on your TV. Take note that without an antenna, you cannot access City TV on your television. City TV can be accessed on a free to air digital box like the Go TV and Star Times box. City TV, it's your world. So why don't you debate John Mahama? He's calling you out for a debate. He says even if you want, you can you, you can let the first lady be the moderator. He's not afraid. 
the, the vice president has answered, and I want to accentuate the vice president's answer, mm. that the debate is already ongoing. Even you and I, what we are doing, even though it's not a debate, typical debate, mm. but you're asking me questions to account for what has happened in Zongo communities, what have you done this in terms of health, that's a debate. It's it's ongoing. But that has so, always been happening. So, yes, we've been seeing presidential debates. That's happening in the US, but Trump is facing Biden and they are having a debate. I mean, even though you may not call it a debate in the right sense of the word. Because but... it's an institutional part of their electoral culture. We don't have that institution. We learned it, we started it. Well, it it then we did no, it. It was they, do you know that they have a whole institution and a mechanism set up as part of their democratic structure yeah, the IEA, for moderating this thing. The, Initially, it was the IEA. The NDC at a point said the IEA was very biased. They, 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 they didn't participate. I think Pre President Mills boycotted one of them because IEA yeah, is biased then, and so on. The National and then, Commission for Civic Education so, came on board and said, was going to, and your party at the time said you are not going to go. Yeah, I'm saying that. If, so, if an incumbent president who doesn't go for debate, yes. it's almost like you're afraid of the battle, isn't it? Well, you, we, we were also an opposition candidate and we didn't go for a debate and we won. So what tells you is that the Ghanaian people know what is happening in their lives. President Kufo used to put it in 2000 as mm -hmm. That is what is relevant for the Ghanaian people. If it's just English, talk is cheap. Mm -hmm. Come and string words together and go. That doesn't impact the lives of people. If I come and I you stand are at the and debate, academic. Yes. Debates are an intellectual academic masterpiece yes, that, that you shouldn't be ruling out. Well, yes, they are just academic. That's what I'm saying. But in academia, I, I can sit there and tell you all the doctrines of jurisprudence and this and that and that. My but at the end of the day, somebody will come and listen to that lecture and say, Charlie, me kope koko be no more. And when he gets back to the hall, then he's confronted. He will realize that jurisprudence won't, won't feed him. So the point I'm making is that if we stand on the podium, and then we talk highfalutin language, high sounding nothings, and, and so on. And then the people go back to, to, to their miserable lifestyle. What will be the purpose of the debate? Resolve the challenges that face the people on the ground. In any event, in, in 2016, and I told you that before when you interviewed me on Eyewitness News, that the Ghanaian people gave their verdict as to who did well and who didn't do well in 2016. I think that that was a, a correct verdict. Let us wait for December 7 for them to give their verdict. They gave that verdict without a face-to-face -face debate between anybody and anybody. And so in the same way, they would be able to give their verdict. The jury is already out there. Go to Facebook and see the debate is ongoing. It's happening all over the place. I'm not sure that people coming back to come and regurgitate what is already existing makes any inter it's even It's stimulating to democracy. It's, it's, it's nice. What, did you not watch the Trump and the Biden fight? I, I, I know. Did you I, enjoy I, it? I, 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 yes, I, for whatever it is worth. But what I'm saying is that in the, in the Western world, you know in the Western world, you know they still talk about, they talk about pro poor pro-choice, mm. this, that, green, this, that. In, in Africa, we are still talking about bread and butter <laughs> issues in Africa. People don't have food to eat. Mm. And you are going to stand there and debate what? Is, is this campaign particularly difficult because of COVID? Do you, do, do you miss rallies? Do you think rallies would have done better than what you are doing? Or this would be a better mechanism moving forward? Well, everything is, is double-edged. There's the advantage part of it and the disadvantage part of it. The disadvantage part of it, first of all, is that, you know, the crowds normally give you a certain sense of how well you are doing or how well you are not doing in certain areas, in how people come out and respond to you. So now you don't have that barometer to be able to, to make a judgment. That's the, that's the disadvantage of it. Number two is that the crowds also give you, they charge you. a psychological booster you know and gives you the certain confidence that that one is eliminated but the advantage of it is that now we are having to do what my good friend uh, the guy who contested mpp youth organizer and and lost uh, uh dominic yeah, yeah. The job day ground the job day ground mm -hmm. you know was his slogan mm -hmm. so now we are having to go back to the ground the door-to-door -door campaign and talking to people so it's one practical one. yes so if the person speaks to you or comes out to you that's voluntary and then you have you have a better way to judge him. Exactly. Than if he stands on... And more often than not, quite frankly, 
many rallies are actually bus, bus, they, bus they, people. No, apart from even the bus, they are your people anyway. Yeah, yeah. You, are, you are mostly preaching to the converted. Okay, okay. You know, because people who don't like you would hardly. Even but if you drive through rallies. a community and watch people come out of their windows to wave at you, that's 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 good. natural. Let me ask you this: since that has been bothering me, chiefs taking part in partisan politics, we have been told by law they shouldn't do it. Dochihini has endorsed Nana Kufado, former of Anana. There's a chief in the Bono region who also endorsed John Mahama. Do you think we are being hypocritical? I guess it's because of the crafting of the law. The law, per the spirit of its interpretation, basically means that you cannot don party colors and say, I'm standing for member of parliament for MPP in this area. You cannot run for political office you cannot be party chairman and be chief and so on but uh, i guess people then think that okay sadia say i haven't come to say that i'm chairman or i'm this but i'm saying that i'm a development chief part of my responsibility as chief is to seek development for my people so if i tell my people that in my opinion this party has provided better development for my community than this then it is not flouting the law. Mm. Uh -huh. So which is why they say those things. So you cannot strictly interpret it as participation in politics because participation per the interpretation that we give it means actively um, occupying a, a position. position. We need to go, but I want you to speak to your Zango people and tell them why for more for Nana is necessary. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Mutanina yan Zango na muku habkuri Shikaranga kujifa ma akufu ado kuria. Sabuda, Zango Development Ministry, the Zango Development Fund, Ababenda, kuda kanku, chikin zangwa ninku, kungani aike nda aka iku, sukure nda muka gina muku, eh, trini nda muka baku, Ababai ba haya nda ba shina chikin zangwa ninda muka zomuka baku, Astrotef Parks nda muka baku, Ababai duka nda muke hii, Eh, Mufara Kinang, Chinese Sunche, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a step. We have started the step in developing the Zongo communities. If we continue in that journey, I believe that in the next 20, 30 years, we shall be able to transform all of our over 3,000 Zongo communities. And that is why you should vote for President Akufo. We may not be fair to the other part of your ministry, which is the, um, is the inner city. Inner city. Uh, will you, do you speak Ghana? No, that's the problem. What other languages do you speak? I just where? speak Ghana, Chi, Dagbani, Mampu. No, you speak Ghana. No, I said Chi mm -hmm. is, is what I speak. Okay, do you speak uh, Dagbani, you speak Mampuli? I speak Mampuli and Hausa. Do you have inner cities in, um, in, uh, in, in Dagbani? No, most of the inner cities are in Western Central. So I shan't, uh, so Chi would work. So Chi would work. Okay, I'll give you another minute for that. Okay. Uh, me, me, and I'll give you an invoice later. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Me, me, and no more. Mm. Ah, your war in a city, Choco or Sioux, send your money from my bama so I am no more be casa. No more, must say, when your mamma will be ano, your gusso, eh, inti, mepamocho, monfa, and nine, and fantuaso, my cufado, na your bar, your sign ye be at waso, Madame Sheikh Dr. Mustafa Abduhamid, thank you for speaking to us on Face to Face. I'm, I'm grateful to you. And that will be for our show today on Face to Face. Thank you for watching. Face to Face will be back again next week on City TV. My name is Umaru Sandamadu. Stay with us. It's your world.